morning ladies and gentlemen. We uh, have the great opportunity here to talk a little bit about calf digestive systems compared to that of the adult. Um, in front of you we've been able to preserve two uh, stomachs. The large one of course represents the adult and the smaller one represents the calf. This calf is about, uh, was about approximately one week of age and the adult was around about uh, 14 months old. So obviously there's a big difference between the two lots of animals. This particular one on the calf, of course, you can see that it um, uh, has a situation where the uh, actual stomachs have been a little bit expanded than normal. Uh, what's happened is, of course, uh, you have the little esophagus here, and this is the small intestine. So to be able to preserve this, what we did was we were able to put a tube down here and with a little small air pump, blow it up to a certain level and then hold it at that and then put in some um, plumbers uh, expansion foam which has been uh, put in there and then over a period of two or three times you eventually were able to get it to a stage where it's now complete. Quite solid, easy to work with, easy to explain. In the case of this um, one with the, um, the adult, the production of this one slightly different. It was also blown up but it was blown up over a five day period. It kept blowing up at, the, at five days because it had a number of holes in it. But what was done differently to this one was it was esterpol. By esterpoling it, the, uh, the liquid was able to soak it into the skin and preserve it. Uh, so after that, though, of course, what was happening is it was uh, easily dented. So again, the foam was placed into this one. So colour-wise, it's not a true reflection of what it looks like internally. This one is true, as true as you can get. This one here has a little bit of a, a brown, dark tinge to it. My two assistants here in Callum and uh, Elijah, uh, both uh, experienced agriculture students who enjoy working both in the field and um, in the classroom. And they fully understand this process of how does a calf's digestive system compare to that to an adult. It also indicates that if you know the understanding of both these um, uh, sets of organs, you can then also manage the way that you feed these animals. Today I'm going to be doing a clinical analysis of a young healthy dairy animal. But first I'm going to run through the internal and externals of this animal, of an animal. This stomach here, it's been preserved and currently the, it was out of a heifer, 14 months of age. This one here is out of a young calf, sadly died of natural causes, which is one week of age. Here I have the ruminum. The ruminum hasn't properly developed yet with the reticulum and, ab and with the omasum. All three of these are currently non-developed in the young calf. Here we have the abomasum, which is the main stomach, also known as the true stomach. This also represents one of the human stomachs as well. This currently holds milk in the young calves before, before they all start eating roughage and able to develop their rumen, reticulum and omasum. Here on this 14 month old heifer, we have the big ruminum here, which has a fibre raft straight through the centre. As you can see, it is expanded as the um, cow has no longer needed to rely on milk. The fibre raft here allows all the small particles to go through, catch the large ones and allows the protozoa and bacteria to properly break the food down, which then will be sent back up to be re which will then move on to the reticulum and then to the omasum. The, re the reticulum has a honeycomb texture to it, also looks like a lot like a honeycomb. The omasum is also known as the Bible, as it has books out of a page, also kind of like a Bible. The abomasum here, it is the true stomach. Here it's also one of the final stages to be sent through. So this pipe here will lead to the small intestines. Currently. In a few seconds, I'm about to get a young, healthy calf here, and I'll run through one of the um, clinical analysis that would have been run through on most farms. So 
So here, today in front of me, I have pumpkin, one of the calves here staying at Noosa District State High. Um, Noosa District, the ag teachers here, have currently um, organised a deal with the um, dairy farmers just out at Kadanga. So currently we've had these calves for now about five weeks. These calves came in week two of this semester, of this term. These calves are eight week old. So, first I'm going to go through a clinical analysis. Now, when I w first walked in here, the calves were bright, happy, and nothing was getting them down. So, I'm going to go through a clinical analysis going from the head right back to the tail, to the rump, through the legs, everything like that. So here, currently, I'm, lo I'm looking at this animal and I'm seeing no discharge in the nostrils or anything like that. I'm seeing no discharge, no white foam, nothing of any sorts. I'm also seeing the muzzle is very moist, which is good, making the animal very healthy. Now, moving to the eyes. I'm looking at the eyes and they're not um, dowsy or anything like that. They're not even um, roughly a bit, a bit cloudy, meaning no signs of pink eye or blight. So right now, I'm now just going to look, have a look at the ears. And I see no discharge in the ears either. Good girl. Now I'm going to do a hydration test on the neck, which roughly does indicate if the calf is staying hydrated, or otherwise we should be looking at why the calf isn't drinking, or how can we help it drink a bit more. As you can see, hydration test, all I do is pull out a bit of skin. The quicker it goes back, the quicker it's hydrated. Means it's hydrated. So now I'm just going to move through, check the animal. I can feel no lumps or cysts or ticks on any of these animals, on this animal here today. I'm also just going to check underneath the brisket here and just behind the leg here. So, so far what I've done is just gone through um, feeling the animal and seeing if I can feel any ticks or anything like that. So, also what I've just noticed is the calf is looking a lot fuller here in the stomach. Meaning she's eaten, means she's eating and also staying a lot hydrated with all her water. So, I'm see I am seeing very little um, scours, runny poos or anything like that. Now, the car, this calf has wee today, and I'm also, and there was no blood or anything like that in the urine, nor is there any blood here in the species here today. So pumpkin here today, I'm roughly going to do. This calf here is very healthy, and I would recommend it. Now the reason also why we do clinical analysis is the school has also invested $150 into this calf and its mate over there, Poppy. $150 in feed, calf muesli, um, loosened hay and milk powder. Good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to complete a clinical analysis of a healthy calf as well as that I'm going to be examining and discussing with the external and internal parts or four stomachs of the calf, the adult animal and the calf, the cow and the calf. In, in front of me I'm displaying, I just said that, in front of me I'm displaying the four stomachs of each. Um, these 
these animals both have four stomachs. These stomachs are called the rumen. Speak up. I am speaking up. The rumen. Where's the rumen? There. And the rumen is here on the cu on the cow. And then we have the abomasum, which is here, which is the true stomach. And then the abomasum is here on the cow. It's heifer. Heifer. And then we have the reticulum, which is also known as the honeycomb, which is here. And on there, it's there. And it's sort of got a pattern coming out on it, on the car. And then the next one we have is the amomasum. A mason, which is the, a Bible, because the, the pattern resembles pages. Um, these, there is a significant difference between these two, because this one is 18 months, and this one was a week old. So you can definitely see the significant difference. Um, on the cow. This the rumen is definitely larger because it's it's processes more solids and stuff. But with this one, the rumen is barely it's quite small actually because it's this is this they they were only digesting milk. The calf. Um, the function of the rumen is on the cow is to digest, digest solids such as hay, grass, um, calf. Um, not calf compost, um, grain, anything hard, solid like that. And on the calf, it wasn't really functional. It was, um, neither was the omasum the, or the reticulum. Um, that was just for digesting milk. The abomasum, the true stomach. Um, also, the function of the room is to just plant material, like I said. Due to bacteria and protozoa creating a fermentation pro process. Um, the function of the reticulum, um, which is here, the honeycomb, is to have small cut particles go through to the amasum and then is regurgitated, which is turned into cut, which is cud. Then the amasum grinds the small part particles down into even smaller, which which is goes into waste absorption um, and the abomasum this one here and there is also is very similar to the human stomach oh, I got this so much. now I'm going to complete clinical analysis of this healthy animal the purpose of this is to maintain a healthy car and so when it's older it's good quality um, this calf will be a part of the breeding herd. She will be carrying her first calf in about 15 months. As this calf is very important to its owners, um, to, of this calf, it's very important, it's important that we do this and make sure it's okay. We have also invested $150 on feed for this cow, calf, sorry, uh, for like milk, milking powder, um, hay, calf crumbles, etc. for this calf as well. Um, the external features that we look for in this calf is that, well, yeah, the main thing is if she's got any ticks anywhere, so you guys run, rub through, check if she's got any ticks anywhere, um, make sure her no nose is moist. Um, yep. Um, also, if you get to catch her when she's um, urinating or she's got some feces, like she's just done it um, check if there's any blood in it or if the urine's clear then she's fine um, want to make sure she's hydrated too so what you do is just pull back the skin pull back fast means she's fine um, yeah and the same thing goes for any like swelling or anything or check if there's any ulcers or anything um, swelling glands around her jaw she she's pretty fine um, That's pretty much it. She's, pretty, she's a healthy calf and she doesn't really need anything else. Here today we've called in our resident vet, Justin. 
he's going to walk us through what he would do on a young dairy calf and a clinical analysis today. Okay, thanks mate. Easy. So, first thing I want to do on an on farm um, is that we start looking at, I start looking at the animals from a distance. Okay, look at the animals, look at the facilities that they're in, checking for things like, is the animal alert, is it bright, does it look normal from a distance? Are the facilities, good facilities, are they dirty, are they clean? Is there any evidence of sickness of the animals? Is there any diarrhea? Is there any abnormal discharges coming from the animal or on the ground around where the animal is? So that's the first thing we'll, first thing I'll look at. Once I've gone from there, I'll start talking to the owner of the animal, start to get a bit of the history, okay? How long has this animal been sick for? What, what signs and symptoms has, been, has the animal been showing? Um, often from that, we can, we can glean a very good by asking the right questions and observing from a distance, we can get a very good um, clinical idea what's going on from the animal. So that's where I'd start with that. From then, the next thing I work to from then is we start with our clinical exam. Now the clinical exam, believe it or not, when, we, when we're working with a cow, actually starts at the back end. We don't actually start from the front end and work backwards, we actually start from the back end and work forwards. So normal thing, we'll, normal thing I'll start with when I'm doing a clinical exam in the cow, first thing we'll do is we'll actually go and take its temperature. So this is going to be good because this one is so still, so we'll take its temperature first. Okay, excellent. Looking for the normal temperature of a cow, which in a calf is glass, because I know that's in your notes. 38.5. Okay, yep, 38.5. Once I get to about 39.5, that's when I start to worry that an animal's starting to get sick. Temperature today of this animal? 39.3. 39.3, so a little bit hot, but this animal's also been at the sun, so I'm not particularly worried about that. Next thing I'll do at the back end is we'll actually look at the mucous membrane color. So in a female calf, we do that just by parting the vulval lips. We have a look, are those membranes pink or white or another color? Normal, normal color should be nice and pink. If they're white or if they're yellow or if they're red, Start to start to get a little bit worried. From there, we'll actually start getting. We'll try and get some urine out of the animal. So generally, we'll do that just by rubbing under the vulva and they'll wee. Unfortunately, this one's just had a wee, so that's not going to going to urinate. I'll get a sample of that. We'll put it on a urine stick we've got here. We look at a few different things. We look for um, some certain toxins in there, such as nitrate. We also look at um, whether there's any blood in the urine whether the urine's got any, the other important one, particularly in the dairy care, is whether it's got any ketones in there, okay? At this stage now, I'll move away from the back end, okay? We'll go in and I'll start examining the cow, and we'll go from, or the calf, and we'll go from the left side. So the next thing I'll do is actually get my stethoscope out, have a listen to the heart and the lungs. So I'm taking the heart rate, and listening to the actual sounds of the heart to make sure that they're normal heart sounds, okay? And normal heart makes a, normal heart in the cow will beat somewhere around 60 to maybe 85 beats per minute and then I'm actually looking listening to see if it's actually they're actually normal beats is what I'm listening to okay from there the next thing I'll be doing is I just list, start listening at the lung field I'm taking the actual respiratory rate of the cow now the respiratory rate in the cow varies quite a lot depending on the heat they actually use when it's a really hot day you'll notice your cows breathe a lot more because they use they don't sweat so they're using that to cool themselves down so I'm listening to see what the actual respiratory rate is and then I'm also listening to see whether the sound of the lungs sounds normal, making sure there's no crackles or pings or rubbing noises. It should just sound like a normal breath like you or I are having basically through the stethoscope. On the left side still, the next thing when we're doing our clinical exam is I'll actually listen to the rumen and I'm listening to the contracting noises of the rumen. The rumen should have a couple of contractions every one to two minutes. So I'm checking that, checking against my watch, making sure that we've got normal signs, normal, normal rate, and then again, the sound it sounds sounds like it, essentially a rumen should sound like a crashing wave on a beach okay once we've done that still on the left side of the cow what i'll do is i'll start flicking the side of the cow now what i'm listening for there that's called percussion what i'm actually what i'm actually listening for i'm listening for any abnormal gassy sounds so say for instance they had something like the displaced abomasum we were talking about before um, when I flick the side of that, it'll actually sound like a piano key. You know what it's like if you grab a balloon or something and you flick a tight balloon when it's got a bit of water and a gas and it makes that real musical type note? Well, the stomach will sound the same when it does that. So, yeah. Okay. Moving from there, next thing I'll come, I'll just move around behind you. Like, next thing is we come around and we look at the head. So I look at the eyes. Do the eyes look normal? Are they sunken? 
because that's our biggest indicator of dehydration. Eyes are, eyes are sunken, okay? Sunken eyes equals dehydration. Look at the eyes, are they normal colour? Look at the mouth and the nose, is there any abnormal discharges coming out of there? No, there's not. Um, we don't tend to look at the mucous membranes in cows or calves at, at, in the mouth, because as you can see there, there's no point, unlike looking at the vulva ones, you look at this one here, everything's black. So I can't get any accurate colour, whether it's pink or not. If we move them around to the side there, and th this, sorry, at this stage too, if I suspect that there's something wrong with the, wrong with the mouth there, I look and say, oh, that doesn't look quite right. I'll note that down and I might come back with actually a, a, a device called a gag where I can open the mouth up and go and have a look down there. We move around to the right side now, and I basically repeat the procedure I did on the left side with my stethoscope on the right side. So again, listening to the heart, checking for heart sounds. I don't generally take the heart rate at this stage because I've done that when I'm on the other side, but I just listen to the heart sounds. I listen to the lungs all over the lung field, make sure they're normal breathing sounds. Come onto this, into this, this uh, right area of the stomach. Now, I can't hear the rumen from over there, and you don't actually hear the small intestines moving, so I'll move straight to my percussion. Again, checking for those musical notes to make sure that there's, make sure that there's no, no musical notes there, so not a displaced abomasum. If we get other conditions where other bits of like small intestine twists or the cecum's got a problem with the cecum or something like that, then we might hear those same sort of musical, musical type notes. Um, from here I've got a fairly good idea what's going on with the calf and then, I'll move, then I might move into some ancillary testing. So ancillary testing is stuff like going back to the mouth, opening the mouth up, taking a poo sample to check for parasites or to check for other bugs taking blood samples if I need to check, if I need to check, uh, check for um, other diseases or just check for the general health of the car. And that will basically, once I get to there, that basically completes my clinical exam. That's it. Questions, guys? Hi, I'm Lara Brandon from Noosa District State High School interviewing Justin Shooth today from Gympie Veterinary services. So Justin, would you like to talk to us about what your job's about? What is my job about? Right, well I have a very varied job is the biggest thing. I do a lot of work on dairy farms, I do a lot of work on beef farms, and then I do some work with horses as well. Occasionally, occasionally I get out there and I do some work with other farm animals, uh, pigs, chooks, goats, uh, alpacas and sheep, but generally in our area, mostly we have farm animal wise, we have dairy cows and beef cows with some horses as well. So I spend most of my day travelling around from farm to farm, um, looking at sick animals, uh, doing some surgery, do a lot of reproductive work, so a lot of, lot of work getting cows in calf, helping people get their horses in foal. Um, we, do some, we do some emergency work as, as well, which we like to call fire engine work, so out there doing emergencies, helping cows have calves, helping helping uh, horses have foals, uh, fixing injuries, looking at illnesses and trying to, trying to make those animals as healthy as possible. That sounds very good. So what are the perks of your work? The best thing I like about my work is actually working with the people. Most people think that the best thing about the job being a vet is working with, with the animals, but actually my, my favourite part, particularly when I'm doing farm work, is working with the farmers. Farmers are really good people to work with. They're friendly. Um, I get to see them a lot of times. A lot of my farms which I'm visiting, I'm visiting once, twice a month. Some of my farms I'm visiting weekly. So I get a really good relationship with my farmers going and they, they go on to be, to be lifelong friends and lifelong workmates, I guess is the way I look at it. What sort of jobs come from where you, your business and what you work around? Oh, what sort of jobs? Again, that's probably the best thing about the job is that it's so varied. So I spend a lot of my time, probably the majority of my time is spent doing reproductive work. So a lot of pregnancy diagnosis in both cattle and horses do a lot of that. A lot of fertility work as well in the males of the species. So uh, checking that, um, that bulls and stallions are able to actually get get their females in females in, in and pregnant. We also do a lot of artificial breeding. So in the horses we'll do some artificial breeding, some artificial insemination. In cattle we'll often set up large programs to get large numbers of females in calf. Um, and then once we've done that of course we'll do a lot of uh, pregnancy testing to check whether these animals are in calf or are in foal. So yeah that's that's probably the majority of the work that, that, that I get to do. Is it hard to get into your work? Like what is what sort of pathways would you have to go okay. through? Yeah, well you definitely need a university education. There is currently two universities in Queensland, two in New South Wales, one in Victoria, one in uh, one in South Australia and one in Western Australia which takes students on for, for becoming a vet. 
Um, most of those unis will still take students straight from school and you'll need pretty good marks to get in to do that. That's not the only pathway, but you can get into uni to do another degree and then if you can get your marks up, transfer over to doing that after that. So the majority of students now that go through doing that are not school leavers. They'll come having done either part of a degree or another degree prior to them prior to them coming coming in and becoming a vet. Would you suggest a job to other people looking for a certain pathway they want to go down? Suggest a, a job outside vet, you mean? Oh, or okay. would you suggest vet as a job for yeah, vet, vet's a pretty good job. It's a hard job. There's yeah. no doubt about that. The hours are very long. Um, you know, the pay it's okay, but you'll never be you'll never be like a, a GP doctor or anything like that. So it is a hard job. It's something that you've got to really want to do. You need to realise that that being a vet doesn't mean that you work from nine to five. It means that uh, you might start your day at five in the morning and then finish it five, six, seven o'clock at night, and then the after hours call comes in for the calving or the foaling or the sick dog or, or the sick horse or something like that. So it's definitely not a nine to five job. There's definitely weekends involved. There's definitely nighttime work involved. So it's something that if somebody wants to get into vet, you definitely have to have a, a desire and a passion for the work, but you also have to have a very good work ethic too, because it does involve some long hours. And yes, you're going to miss you're going to miss your cousin's, second cousin's, plumber's, boyfriend's wedding and that because you're going to be out carving a cow. Um, but these things happen and you know, it's just, it's really is a lifestyle, not just a job. Um, thank you for coming here today and I would like to thank you on behalf of us for being here to interview. No problems at all, thank you very much Lara. No problem.